Hello, welcome to our talk, the place where we agree to disagree, if we disagree at all. Today, my guest comes from New York. Her name is Wendy Can. She is an author, she is a Feldenkrais therapist, um, and she's an interesting woman. I'm going to talk with her on the topic of embodiment. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Renee. This looks like a wonderful place you're sitting in uh, with all these paintings behind you. A big room, where are you? I'm um, in my studio, my Feldenkrais studio, which sometimes doubles as an art studio. So, um, so I hang my paintings on the wall to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that gives a nice atmosphere. I'm very glad that we also share some of your paintings with you. I would like to introduce you to our viewers first. A few words. I already mentioned that you're an author. Actually, I prepared to uh, show something to our viewers. Look at this. And if I go a little bit closer, if I can, go closer, we will actually, wait a minute, we see Wendy right here. <laughs> so lovely to see you with your book on your cover. Uh, this was back in 2006, I believe. And um, you came out with the book, Casting with a Fragile Thread, a story of sisters and Africa. And a uh, critic said the following, written with fierce love, it's heartbreaking, almost unbearably real, and incredibly hopeful. So dear viewers, if you're interested in this book, uh, go to our website, see Wendy's biography on our website and also in the description of the YouTube. But today we're about uh, something else. Wendy has already shown some of her artworks, so she's a painter as well. She was initiated to the master's degree in 1996, quite a while ago already. And as we already mentioned, she's a Feldenkrais teacher and a Feldenkrais therapist nowadays. Also, her website, if you want to contact her, will be shown a little bit later. Now, um, Wendy, you really, you really put me on the spot here with that topic embodiment. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I know the word. Of course, I use it in everyday language. Um, but to be quite honest, um, I was blind to the fact that embodiment is a terminology in, uh, used by anthropologists, by psychologists, psychologists today. It's actually quite a catchphrase. So I couldn't believe it when uh, you suggested this word um, because my associations were not on the topic as I think you will explain or help me to understand it tonight. Uh, I'm very curious and I'm also a little bit torn to tell you the truth because when I looked at some of the literature and lo and behold, uh, there's only very smart literature around, you know, intellectual academic work. 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 Um, I, I also ended up saying, "What's the big deal?" Um, I mean, you know, we all know in a healthy body there is a healthy mind, a healthy soul, and vice versa. If our mind is not healthy, our body will. Even Aristoteles, some two and a half thousand years ago, already knew that. So I have a little bit of a dilemma that on the one side, I want to understand it better. On the other side, I'm going, what's the big deal? Interesting, and I would like uh, to have our viewers uh, uh, sneak insight on this. When I first approached you some two and a half weeks ago, would you do an art talk with me? We started... Um, as a spin-off of an earlier conversation we had about political correctness in art, um, and you focused in on contemporary current events, um, be they political or be they relating to the pandemic, um, how, how do we know it's fake news? How is 
are things real or not? We had temporarily the topic of true-ish. <laughs> uh, that was then, and then we got to talk, and uh, you said, no, embodiment is really what I would like to talk about. And I was startled. This was uh, seven days, 10 days ago. Mm. When, then a week ago, roughly, I received the newest publication in the Reiki community. Um, there's quite a lot of scholars who publish nowadays. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and this is brand new. I mean, it's hot off the press. Page um, three, page three. I read it out to you. Therefore, before we consider the inner dimension of spirituality, we need to locate it and take its location to be grounded and centered in the body. It is from here where spirituality can be seen to transcend the material body and connect to the concept of embodiment. <laughs> I was going to this. Now, I know the authors of this book, and actually one of them, uh, um, I intend to have an art talk on the topic of surrender. So, by the way, I mentioned to her, I got this woman in New York wanting to speak about the embodiment. And you know what? She said, I wrote a dissertation about it. And she sent me her dissertation. You'll have to say it. It's your topic. Over to you. <laughs> okay. So, what brought me to embodiment? I think that when I was writing my novel is when I felt at first, when I was, it was a memoir, it wasn't a novel. I felt at first, I um, found that when I wanted to remember something, um, I would go inside. I would go inside to a place and to my chest. I would remember the smells. I'd remember the sounds. And the memory came up so clearly then. And um, there was a truth to it. And I've also found with my painting and generally enjoying creative practice, enjoying being in that flow state that we talk about. And I realize that that flow state is an embodied state. It's your whole body. It's when you can get out of your head and feel your whole self. And then that took me to Feldenkrais, which is a way of... Uh, particularly going into your body, feeling what you feel in your body. The latest studies show that emotions are actually body contractions and we interpret them depending on our environment. If you have a rumble in your belly when you're in a hospital waiting room, you interpret that as fear or nerves. If you have a rumble in your belly and you're walked into a bakery, then you to experience that as hunger. I think particularly in this day and age where the, the news outside of us bounces us around like a pinball machine, to, <laughs> to have a way of returning to your body, not the stories in your head about who you are and what you've learned and your degrees and your your address all of these things these markers that we have but return to what do i actually sense and feel and it's and it's interesting in teaching the feldenkrais i say that the hardest thing in feldenkrais is to to sense and feel yourself sense and feel yourself as a whole being not as a sore shoulder or a this hip or a uh, you know, wonky foot or a divorced person or a this person as a professor or a secretary or a teacher, but to experience and feel your whole self. And that's an embodied, an embodied feeling. Um, actually, I intend to go, I planned to go in about two directions. One, tapes, and you just said markers, and I'm curious whether that's one and the same thing, because in the last conversation you referred to tapes. And the other uh, interesting catchword uh, when we had our preliminary conversation was symphony of voices. So these are the, basically the two topics, but um, or the two directions uh, I, I made uh, a note of in my mind. Um, you know, you spoke about the flow 
And um, as a, a marathon runner in the old days, um, I have a good, pretty good idea. Or also, when I ski still today, and um, uh, when I get into physically into a flow state, and I'm listening to you, and I'm saying I'm, I'm still thinking in this dilemma. But this is like almost like old news. I mean, I never felt that the mind had such a predominant, or the intellect such a predominant uh, position in. Uh, the awareness in society and people's experience of themselves that they feel like I am the injured shoulder or the displaced uh, joint. So th this is a bit of a dilemma I have. Um, can you can you say something to that? Yes, I can. And hopefully this answers it. Is a very famous American writer at a, a college commencement speech said, um, gave a little vignette of saying, the old fish said to the two younger fish, how is the water? And the two younger fish said, what's water? <laughs> we don't, because we live it, we inhabit our own skin. We've developed this history in our own skin. We've developed particular muscular contraction, particular ways of breathing, particular ways of standing on one leg. Um, holding our belly, holding our chest, a particular ways of, of, of moving through the water. And we don't realize that that's just a way of moving through the water. If, if you give yourself the, if one has the opportunity to, to move in slightly different ways and find the ease in that way, the way the breath opens up, then it's possible to inhabit your own skin and feel lighter, to realize that you are, um, to realize that you are moving through water and that you can can swim through it in a different way. And, and that impacts the way you sense and feel yourself. The Freud, I mean, Moshe Feldenkrais actually developed this um, practice um, partially in answer to Freud. He felt Freud didn't go far enough. And when you go with stories, if you have, and as val val psychotherapy and therapy is immensely valuable, of course, but you have the stories to tell. If you go into where, where, the, where you feel those things in your body, not not in a way that brings the history with it, but in a way of just feeling, how are you holding your chest? Is there a way to hold your chest in a different way? And it brings immense relief to, to suddenly realize you. <laughs> you made me do that. <laughs> but not in, a, not in a posture police kind of way, but in a, oh, I can make the slight adjustment and suddenly my head feels so much more free. And, um, yeah, I actually, um, of course, on your w w website, you have a very wonderful quote of Moshe Feldenkrais. Uh, what I am after isn't flexible bodies, but flexible brains. What I am after is storing human dignity. And this connected with, uh, with the Aristotelian uh, um, uh, knowledge or wisdom that actually the, the mind or the spiritual health um, is closely related to the physical health. And these are only two planes, so to speak, of our, uh, of our holistic being. We are even more complex than that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that I, I can follow that. And to me, um, it, it is um, having been in holistic um, healing processes, having been interested as a Reiki teacher, having been involved, of course, um, this is to some degree bread and butter uh, to me, the holistic approach. Um, and yet I am with you and I wasn't making fun uh, when I uh, shivered because you truly inspired me to actually loosen up. 
I was a little bit uh, um, uh, excited or, or tense uh, before we started speaking. So uh, this is actually not a bad example to show that even something small can make a big change in one's own emotional um, uh, feeling, um, emotional uh, experience of oneself. Um, and not only that, how um, one is into reacting, communicating with another person. Tell me about those tapes, please, would you? Uh, tell me what you mean by tapes. What did, what did you hear me say? I'm not clear on what you thought I said about tapes. Oh, oh that you're not moving according to habit. Is that, Is what, that what you meant? Because you know, dear viewers, we are not pre-discussing our conversations here, yeah. but obviously I'm asking my uh, guest, would you like to join? And we touch on it. And then I listen a little bit what the person says about the topic. And I caught that particular sentence from you. And I'd, I'd like you to expand on that, please. When we develop as children from the very first time we first roll over as a baby, it's, um, you know, it's taken for granted that babies will, you know, unless they don't, and then it's really clearly a big problem, but that babies will roll over, they'll come to sitting, they'll come to standing, but every baby figures out how to roll over in his or her particular way. Every baby comes to sitting in his or her particular way, comes to standing, develops an individual walk. You recognize your friends across a football field because of the way they walk. And we don't only, and so I call that a kind of a tape, it's a habit. It's how you move the, the leg you rely on more, the shoulder you rely on more, but it's not just a physical, you can't separate the physical moving from thinking, sensing and feeling. It's all one nervous system. So you also develop habits of of being aware of if your crib is in one corner of the room, you always have to look in a particular direction for your mother, you develop a little bit more um, awareness on one side than on the other side. And we all have this, no one's symmetrical, no one has a perfect um, platonic kind of um, physiology. But it's the habits that we're not aware of and the emotional habits, the habits of, um, of thought. So where do you put your attention? You can choose where you put your attention, mm -hmm. but we put our attention in particular places. We don't realize a choice. And this is the thing with embodiment. If you can feel the nuances within your own skin of, oh, I could move this way. I could move this way. I can choose to put my attention on, on this. I can choose to put my attention on that. And you have a visceral sense of what that, what happens with, when you choose to put your attention on this or that, how it catches your breath, then and that, have it. and that in turn would have been, sorry, and that in turn would have an effect on other aspects of your being. For example, that it, could it um, almost like trigger maybe certain memories um, if you experience your body or through your body, to be more precisely, if you experience yourself through a different perception of your body, that actually your memory changes, your view can change. Because when you first used the analogy to tapes, that sounded to me much like uh, one of my favorite expressions, belief systems, mm -hmm. uh, you know, indoctrinations, uh, which of course, lead to exactly the kind of patterns which later on very often we are caught in almost like in a in a corset uh, mm -hmm. we are in a prison um so that you're such a, tell me something then if this is i saw you nodding if this is halfway through where does if there is such a thing <laughs> as karma mm -hmm. uh, if we, if we think that if we adopt for a moment, whether one believes in it or not, um, that there is such a thing as we are born into an existence with already certain memories uh, being part and parcel of our, if you want, DNA or of our matrix, of our blueprint. Um, are you suggesting that this is where... Um, these old 
ingrained, maybe over generations, ingrained behavioral patterns can be altered, even um, be get gotten rid of? All I'm saying is that, um, and I think this is true across Reiki, across Feldenkrais, and many contemplative practices, is ask yourself the question. You know, one of the big Zen questions is, what was your face before your mother was born? What, what have you, what have you, and this is a, it's, you know, this intrinsic question of what is there and what do we take on, how do we adjust to society, parental controls, societal controls, you know, what, what's there and what's, what do we bring on and conform to? And, and I'm saying is, ask yourself the question and if you can if you can feel if you're more sensitive to what you feel in your body then you've got a place to go to for answers i mean you must know this with teaching reiki is is if you if you're very sensitive in your own skin the reiki is powerful more powerful you know, to be open. Your perception is more powerful. Yes, your understanding is more powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and and so if you can go through with an awareness of even when you're washing dishes, am I doing this in the easiest way, or do I have my teeth clenched and I'm kind of leaning in an odd way, or can I do this using my whole skeleton, my whole self? This easily? is very unfair, Wendy. Because <laughs> you don't wash dishes. I do work things. I did so last night, very late, after a long, long, long day. And you just caught me. I was clenching my teeth when I was washing dishes. But it's all of these things, you know, how do you brush your teeth? We were taught to brush our teeth when we were one or two. And we still might have that same grip of when yeah. our mother or father was looking over our shoulders, sticking this bristly thing in our mouth, and we're just running the same tape of toothbrushing. And instead of going asking, are we doing this? Am I brushing my teeth in the easiest way? And that's yeah. the question to go back to your body as you're going through your life. It's really simple. Am I doing this in the easiest way from an embodied feeling to all the engagements that you have with your day-to-day -day being? Is this the easiest? I'm very glad you said this about finding the most comfortable, the easiest, the healthiest way of doing small things. And those small things being often representatives for, for representative for maybe something other. Because uh, when I spoke earlier uh, about memory and discovering memories, I wouldn't want anyone to believe that it is necessary to um, remember Mm. what has happened in the past. That's not the objective. The mm -hmm. objective is actually precisely like you, uh, like you described it. And I had a Japanese uh, Reiki student here today and I got to talk with her about karma. Mm. And um, uh, I remembered that an American uh, man uh, back in Hong Kong in a public talk by Sogyal Rinpoche, which is a Tibetan uh, monk, and um, he asked the question, the American asked the question, um, what is karma? And Tsyokoyal Rinpoche was obviously slightly frustrated. He, he was nicknamed the, the choking monk because he always made jokes when mm -hmm. he gave his public lessons. And he actually got up from his podium uh, on, on, on the stage and he went down into the audience and he went right up to that man and he leaned over to him and he said, dear friend, your karma sits right here in this chair. Everything you ever thought and did, it's right here. You don't need to have any answers than that. And he went back. <laughs> Uh, I, I like the, um, and I, I wish I could remember who to attribute to, it's definitely not my own thought, but is um, the thought that the idea that you re reincarnated every time you use the word I. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one too. All right. Now, we have to, mind, I'm picking a little bit. We have roughly another four or five minutes, Wendy. Oh, so okay. we're almost over. 
and uh, that would be an interesting other conversation um, uh, because um, uh, karma is one thing uh, almost with spiritual religious connotations but one could look at programming uh, from a DNA point of view, more from a biological genetic point of view, uh, where, of course, uh, we don't start at scratch when we are born. We, we bring along a, a lot of uh, biological luggage uh, probably mm -hmm. with us. Topic yeah. for another day. Tell mm -hmm. me about those symphony of voices. What do you mean with that? Oh gosh, I, I can't remember the exact what the context of the conversation. Give me a little prompt, Renee. What's I have it? none. But <laughs> that's what you get when you are an artistic, poetic, uh, philosoph <laughs> philosophizing, um, a talker with me. You you know we inspire each other, and you come out with a mouthpiece. Which I mean, the symphony of voices. What an expression. I can't remember exactly what it was in context to when we had our little preparation, but I would, what comes to mind now when we talk about a symphony is thinking of ourselves in terms of, of a symphony of, of self and environment. How, um, you know, our nervous system forms in relation to an environment. It forms if there was nothing to see, we would never learn to see. If there was nothing to hear, we would never learn to hear. Um, how do we, and so I think the question is, how do you feel, how do you feel yourself? How do you let go of enough muscular tension to feel more of a porous boundary between your, you and your environment and not a self-protective boundary? Even the tiniest little thing, I'll talk about embodiment, if, there's a, a real truth to um, the words, oh, he made me feel small or she made me feel small. When, when you're nervous, when you're, you can't, your muscles contract, you do get smaller. It's a literal thing. And when your breath is easy and your musculature is soft and you feel confident in gravity, you feel taller and more permeable to the environment. And... Um, and again, to go back to yourself, to go back to your feeling sense, is this the easiest way? Am I doing this the easiest way? Is a way of going home instead of having a little story about, is this polite to do in society going on in your head? <laughs> I have to give more thought to what I meant about the symphony of, of voices. I know you had a you had a something too. You said, oh, I usually say this. Um, and you said, but can you remember what yours was? <laughs> no, but I remembered something else, Wendy. I um, Today, um, that's short-term memory for you. Uh, today, this Japanese lady, um, uh, she has spent a lot of time in Europe, uh, 20, 30 years. And yet, she is very typical Japanese. So, uh, it's like two cultures living embodied in, in one physical body. And uh, very often in our conversation, we went back and forth and I said to her, well, you can look at, look at it from that angle, from your Japanese background, or you can actually look at it from with a, within a Western context. And uh, that helped her a lot. And we started to giggle, of course, when we came to uh, say, and this is only two because yeah. we have so many more fragments of our personality, so many more eyes, um, like you said earlier on. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I think so, you know, I think it's key. I think, as I said, it's key in, in all the contemplative practices, Reiki, Feldenkrais, meditation is is awareness. And with awareness comes choice. And then we can choose what lens we want to look through or know that this is a lens not the lens and uh, tremendous freedom comes with that this is oops sorry <laughs> my mistake this is actually very beautiful what you just said uh this freedom of choice and to me you said awareness and earlier when you used the story with the fish uh i thought well in that picture like the water is like consciousness uh, uh, so I think we're coming to a nice spot in our conversation. 
Um, I would like to get to a close, yes, 30 minutes. And um, I'm actually sorry, I want to also show um, our viewers your website down here, where you can reach Wendy Can directly. Um, I was very unfair by um, reducing in the introduction Wendy only to, not her personally, but in the biography, only a few key points. Um, she has a lovely family. She is a mother. She has experienced a lot of things. So her biography will also briefly be on our um, own website. And of course, on Wendy's website, you can contact her and get to know more about her. Wendy, uh, one final question. How do you feel at the end now? How was this for you? Oh, this was so fun. This was this was great, Renee. Lovely to. I, lo I always love delving into these um, these deep conversations. It's um, it's uh, it was it was funny. My daughter once said to me, came home from school one day, and she said, "Mom, do you know that not everybody analyzes dreams." <laughs> Because, <laughs> because uh, it's the water I like to swim in is these um, chewing over these big ideas. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. I thank you very much for enriching the art talks. Uh, I say goodbye to you for now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for viewing. If you like this, please subscribe. And I hope to see you again uh, with our next art talk. Bye-bye.